Thank you, Jesus. We, um, we last week, we talked about Jesus' final week on earth. We talked about, of course, last Sunday was Palm Sunday. We talked about what that was and, and that, um, you know, they laid palm branches out for Jesus to make his triumphal entry, but, uh, but they were a little confused on what was going on. They thought, they thought Jesus had come to fix their problem, you know. You know, Jesus does come and fix our problems. He does do that. But he was more concerned about fixing them than their problems. You know, that's what God is concerned about you. He's willing to fix us. Where, whatever area of our life needs that, needs to be fixed, God is always working. There's a scripture that says that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He's always fixing. Sometimes we, we tear up things that he's put together and he has to mend them and fix them. So that was Palm Sunday. Then we, uh, then we talked about what Monday Thursday was. And I remember I told you guys I never even heard of these things, but it's good to be educated about all this. Monday Thursday was the day that we celebrate Jesus giving a new commandment, the commandment to love one another, um, you know, and, and that is so important. And, and uh, what was the, the video for National Day of Prayer? They won't know you by your job title or, or by that you're a Christian by your financial statement or uh, just how good you can play volleyball or, or whatever. They will know you're a Christian by your love. By your love. And, and, and I said last week, I think the Lord gave me a fresh revelation because he said this to them right before he went to the cross to, to pay a price for them to be able to go to heaven. So I, I think the ultimate love for somebody, if you, if you really love somebody, the first thing will be on your mind toward them is to make sure they get to heaven when they leave this earth. If you love somebody, that will be the priority you can, you can treat them good later, you know, just kidding. Treat them good all the time. But the priority is to make sure they get to heaven. And then we uh, talked about uh, Good Friday and uh, how it did, didn't look like it was a Good Friday. And we talked about how good doesn't mean easy. Good doesn't mean easy and how it's hard sometimes to do good things. Like a good thing is not to retaliate when somebody insults you. A good thing is not to hold a finger up in traffic when somebody's sitting texting and the light turns red again. You know, that's the good thing is to do the right thing, but it's not always the easiest thing. But God's working on us. That just is a proof to God to me because our nature is to sin, but God when you're born again, you get a new nature. You become a new person, and he's working on getting us away from our old self and those old ungodly ways. That's what he does. Uh, but today, you know, Good, good Friday was, man, by all appearances, a, just a hard day. We talked about it, Jesus being nailed on the cross. Uh, before that, before he was nailed on the cross, they whipped him with the whip that had bone and and rock and and uh, and other metal, whatever they could find, glass or pottery. In in the end of it, where it would just rip his flesh apart, and you could see inside, and uh, how that that whipping actually would kill people at times in itself. And uh, he was betrayed, he was mocked, he was beaten. It, it didn't look like a good day, really. But it was Friday. And Sunday was coming. It was Friday. And Sunday is coming. You know, one thing I have learned through my lifetime, especially when I'm walking with the Lord, really just walking with the Lord, as you will have Fridays in your life. You will have days where there, it's a hard day for whatever reason. The wheels are falling off the wagon. If it's a, if it's a, if it's a spouse thing, if it's a child thing, if it's just a work thing, whatever, there, there will be Fridays in your life. But one thing I've learned for certain, that with Jesus Christ, Sunday always comes around. And he always fixes 
whatever needs to be taken care of. And today, we are going to talk about the good news. We're going to talk about Sunday. We're going to talk about the resurrection. So if you would, let's open our Bibles to John, the first chapter. I'm so sorry, the 20th chapter. We're going to start in the first verse. And we're going to read through the 20th verse. If you would, uh, you, can, you can use the Bible in the pew or you can look at the screen or use your app or whatever. But uh, let's read that. Uh, the first verse starts like this. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. I guess let me set it up. Jesus had been crucified. And uh, a rich fellow named Joseph had a tomb for him. He went and asked for Jesus' body. He took him and put him in this tomb. tomb, and that was Friday, but the next day was Saturday, the Sabbath. And so the Jews couldn't do anything on that day. And so this, the first day of the week was, uh, was Sunday. And Mary went to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. The soldiers had rolled a big stone in front of the tomb. Uh, And so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. When Peter went out with the other disciples, they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, as, and as she went, she stooped in, to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. She, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she, gave, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. She said, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we thank you for this day, God, and uh, what it means to the whole world and to us. God, I just pray that you, uh, as, as Paul prayed, Lord, that the words that come out of my mouth will be given by you. Lord, help us, help them to edify and strengthen us all. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You know, I like this stage of my life. I'm in the grandparent stage. <clears throat> Actually, I don't know if any other grandparents feel this way, but 
this is the best stage of life that I've enjoyed the most. Grandkids, as, as uh, typically only grandparents can attest to, are so much fun. It's such a, it's such, it's such a good time. There's so much entertainment. I'm thankful for my grandkids. I guess because in part, uh, I'm not responsible if they grow up to be crazy or not. Their parents, that's their duty. And uh, so I just have, it's all fun and games with me and them, you know. And, and I, think I, I think the Lord prepared me to be a grandparent, a granddad, uh, even before I had grandchildren, uh, because a granddad, uh, some of you may know this, but they have a lot of corny, annoying jokes. And I have been blessed with that talent for a long time. And so, uh, you, know, you know, and so I get to share them with my grandkids. And, you know, when they're three and four, they love it. You know, and I think I made up a few, like uh, knock, knock, atch. God bless you. So, and, and, then, and, then, and then you get to teach them a little Bible and, and play tricks and, and have a joke with them as well. You know, it's like I ask them this, you know. How many of each animal did Moses take with him on the ark? Ah, it wasn't Moses. It it was Noah on the ark. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And then then this one, you guys probably all heard this one before. Uh, Who's in Grant's Grant's tomb? Who's buried in Grant's tomb? You know, it would be Grant, in case you're still thinking. It would be Grant. On this next question I have for you today, if you want to stand or if you want to clap or if you want to shout, feel free to do it. I want to ask you today, who's in Jesus' tomb? Nobody's in that tomb. He is risen. He is Lord. That's right. You know, if you look in the tomb of Confucius or Buddha or Muhammad, guess what you'll find? You'll find their bones there. But if you look in Jesus' tomb, there's nothing there unless somebody else used it after he was there. Do you know why Jesus' bones aren't in that tomb? Do you know why? Because you can't kill God. He is God. You can't kill him. Actually, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. I'm the life. You can't put to death the life. He told Martha that I am the resurrection and the life. He's the life. You can't kill him. That's how we know that He is God. That's why today is so important. It proves that Jesus is who He said He he is or was. He is the Messiah. He is God Almighty. That's who Jesus is. You know, and that's why, that's why people try to disprove the resurrection. That's why, that's why atheists especially try to disprove the resurrection. Because if they can disprove the resurrection, they can say like all the other religions say about Jesus, they, they could say that he's just a prophet or a teacher or a good man. See, he's still dead. But if the resurrection is true, he is who he said he was. He is the Son of God. That's who he is. Jesus is God. So, uh Many atheists have tried to disprove him. And I, I, you know what happens a lot of times when they try to disprove the resurrection? They study hard. They study hard to do that. And they end up getting saved. They end up giving their life to Jesus because they realize it's so true. There's so much, uh, there's so, so many documents outside of the Bible that uh, prove that Jesus resurrected from the dead. You know what they first said about him? It's not in this portion of the resurrection, but in another chapter, the Pharisees paid the guards and said, hey, tell them the disciples came and got Jesus and took his body away. And, uh, and, and that would mean that the disciples would have to lie for all those years. And you know what that means? They would have to lie and say, yeah, we, they said they didn't come and get him, but yeah, you can kill me, you can... You can uh, hang me upside down on a cross, you can throw rocks at me and stone me, you can do all those things, uh, but I'm going to keep to this lie. I loved what Chuck Colson said. You know who Chuck Colson is? Chuck Colson lives in heaven today, but he, he was with Richard Nixon. 
He was part of the Watergate scandal. Anybody remember that? He actually went to jail because he did some stuff he shouldn't do. But he, but before his trial and his imprisonment, he became a Christian. He was one of these very intellectual guys as well. Even after he became a Christian, I love to listen to him speak. But he wrote this one time about the resurrection. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 11 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it were not true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me that 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Absolutely impossible. It's the truth. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. You know, and one time Jesus said, this is the most important event in Christianity. One time the Pharisees said, the Pharisees said, we want a sign from you to prove who you are. Show us a sign. Well, Jesus very well could have healed somebody right there on the spot. He healed lots of people in that day, walking on earth. And do you know that Jesus still heals today? If you need a healing today, ask Jesus to heal you. No matter what it is, don't think it's too small or too big. He hasn't changed. The Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. Ask him for healing. He still heals. Or Jesus could have gave him a sign. You know what he could have done? He could have, he could have done another big miracle. Remember, he fed 5,000 people with just a few fish and a few loaves. He could have done that as well right in front of them. He could have said, okay, let's feed everybody at this moment. Or to show that he provides. He still provides. You need provision, you go with Jesus. Let me show you another provision, a provision example. You, you remember one time Jesus and Peter. Peter was in the right place. He was hanging with Jesus. You need to hang with Jesus. He was hanging with Jesus, and they went into the temple, and they, you had to pay a tax to go into the temple. Don't get me going on taxes. But isn't that crazy? You had to pay. With, who said it? Ben Franklin, two things for certain, taxes and death. But that's for sure. And they had to pay a tax, and I love this story because I think God has a sense of humor. I th- and sometimes I think it lines up with mine. Maybe not as corny, maybe not as annoying, but, but uh, he sent, Jesus sends Peter to catch a fish, and in the fish's mouth has a coin for them to pay the tax. I think that's hilarious. I'm thinking that's what my, me and my buddies would do to each other. Hey, go fishing. And, you know, instead of why didn't Jesus say reach in your pocket and pull out a coin? Or why didn't Jesus say, oh, nothing behind your ear. Oh, what's that? You know, look at there. There's a the coin. He could have done that as well. But I think he was showing a point to Peter. He was showing a point that I can bring financial support and help provision to you from the craziest of places. The craziest of places. And you know what? He was teaching Peter other things as well. Did you know that our God is very complex? His ways are so much higher than our ways. He's so much smarter than us in layman's word. His his thoughts are way above our thoughts. And we use words like this today. We use statements like this. Let's peel this back or, or, or let's, uh, uh, let's um, what, what's the other one I'm trying to think of? Let's unpack this. Here, let me unpack this. You know what? God is so big and vast and, and just amazing that he, when he's working on one thing in our life, God, you know God is a multitasker. He can work on my temper and, and my annoyance at the same time. He can work on this sin and, and me loving people better at the same time. He is so complex. And, and when you peel every layer, you peel back of God, everything you unpack is only good and wise and truthful. So we should peel back. We, we need to peel back everything. We need to seek God. You know, to unpack is to say we need to seek God. We need to seek God. In the story we just read, I love what Mary did. I love what Mary did. You remember, if you, you were paying attention there, and didn't fall asleep while I was reading that. That happens with my grandkids. They fall asleep while I'm reading. Um, 
Mary hung out at the tomb. Remember, Peter and John said, okay, Jesus is not here, we're leaving. Jesus is not here, we're leaving. What did Mary do? Mary said, hmm, I'm not ready to go just yet. I'm going to look again. I'm going to seek a little harder. I'm going to be diligent in my pers- and persistent in seeking God. I'm going to look in there again. And her persistence paid off. Do you know that the scripture says that the Lord rewards those who diligently seek him? He rewards them. Don't give up. I, I prayed for that yesterday. I prayed that my wife would treat me better yesterday. It didn't work. Pray again. Pray again. You, you, you diligently seek the Lord. You don't give up. I love that about Mary. She was rewarded. Jesus showed up to her. That's why it's so important to have a prayer life. It's so important not just to to seek God for a second, but spend some time with Him. Be persistent. Be diligent with, with seeking God because you will be rewarded. You will be rewarded. You will be rewarded. And, and then actually, you know, what's cool about that is that um, Mary was really the first person to proclaim the gospel. She went by and said, I have seen him. He is alive. You know, we talk about the resurrection and all the proof. And, you know, um, there's some guys who've done a good job studying all that and all the information they've gathered. And there's, there was 500 witnesses. There's more proof about the resurrection than any other historical event. There's more secular proof about it. But you know what? I, I don't have to have that secular proof for me because I know, you know how I know Jesus is alive? It's because I have felt him. I have heard his voice. You know, you don't always see the Lord. It's, I love what Billy Graham said. He's kind of like the wind. You don't see the wind. You see the effects of the wind, but you don't see the wind. It's the same way with God. You don't necessarily see God, but you feel the effects of God. There, we all have felt that. There's not a person on earth who haven't at some point, at some time, had that thought about God that just captivated your whole being, and that's all you could think about. That's the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. So what does that mean for you and me? What does that mean for you and me? Because Jesus came out of that grave, which he did, what does that mean for you and I? That means that we can have hope. We sang that this morning. We sang 1 Peter 1.3 this morning. It says you can have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what that means? Look, listen to me. Your glass doesn't have to be half empty anymore. If you're a half empty person... Today is your day to get that out of your system because there is nothing. If you're walking with God, there is nothing he can't do or change in your life. You don't have to look at things half empty anymore. You can look at things through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of the resurrection to say, hey, this can change. This can get better. You don't have to dwell on the negative. I've got some news for you guys. There will be negative hits your life. It's, uh, maybe you haven't been there yet. That was a joke. We've all been there, but we don't have to stay there. Because of the resurrection, it was Friday. That negative is Friday, but Sunday's coming. Sunday's always coming. If you're in Jesus, if you're a Christian, Sunday is always coming. He's going to pull you out of whatever you're in the middle of that's killing you, that's destroying you, that's breaking up your family, that's causing you to have doubt, that's causing you to have fear. You don't have to live in that spot anymore. Jesus can change your life. You say, Jerry, how do you know that? Because I've been there. I've done that. How do y'all know that? Have you been there? Have you done that? Has Jesus changed your life? He changes your life. So because of the resurrection, we can have hope. Because of the resurrection, we can have joy. We can have joy because of the resurrection. You don't have to be in sorrow and depression. Ask the Lord to change that today. Because of the resurrection, you can have joy. Because of the resurrection, you can have peace. You can have peace in your heart. That's funny. We read this scripture. We read this scripture. Where were the disciples? They were hiding with the door locked. 
They were hiding with the door locked. You know, that's what fear will do for you. Fear will lock you in. It'll lock you in. It'll shut you in. It'll shut you up. Fear can control you. The devil has used fear on almost all of us before. But you don't have to stay in fear anymore because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He conquered fear. He conquered death. He conquered sorrow. He conquered everything that comes against you to destroy you. Jesus has conquered by coming out of the grave, by that resurrection power. Because of his resurrection, there's one more thing, uh, two more things. You can have love in your heart because of his resurrection. You can have love in your heart. You know, I became a Christian when I was 17. And I, I, I honestly, th- this is sad to say, but Patty, who has always been much smarter than me, would say, I love you. And you know what my reply would be? We were dating. I, I, I wouldn't answer. I, you know, I'd do the guy thing and just kind of mumble something and walk away. You, you know why? Because in my head and in my heart, I always wondered what love was. I really did. God, I don't even know what love is. I don't even know. I know y'all looking at me like you were pretty stupid. I was. I am. I meant it. But you know what? When Jesus Christ came into my life at 17, I noticed my life changing. You know what? My want-tos started changing. My want-tos. No longer did I, I want to do things that uh, just cause problems. Like I no longer did I want to do the drugs. No longer did I want to do the alcohol. No longer did I want to do all the cussing. No longer did I, I, I wanted to, and finally I wanted to do the right thing. And you know what I noticed? I noticed that my heart was changing and I was liking people. This is weird. I'm 17. I'm a punk. I'm liking people. And I, I've told you guys this story before, but an elderly lady pulled out in front of me and I was in my cool Mustang being cool like usual. And I was a new Christian, a few weeks old maybe. Somebody's laughing at me being cool. Cool. That kind of hurts my feelings a little bit. I used to have a mullet. (laughs) But this lady pulls out. You know what I used to would have done? I mean, I would have got so mad. Patty used to say, you're so hot-tempered. You're so hot-tempered. And and then I would just cuss at her. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. But... This little lady pulled out in front of me, and, and from in here, I heard a voice. This is how I know God's resurrected. I heard him say, that's okay. You'll do that to somebody someday. I was like, Lord, you're real. This is a real thing. I mean, this is real. I can remember that 40 years later like it was just yesterday because God is real. The resurrection is real. But you know, so Jesus has done everything we need to do. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for all of our sin. Uh, He paid a debt that we owed. Now we owe it all to him. He paid that debt. He, He was crucified, dead and buried. He rose from the grave. He's ascended to heaven where he sits at God's right hand. Always make an intercession for you and me. That means he's always trying to help us. It's a good thing for me, I know. He's always trying to help us. But so he's done it all. But now the ball's in your court. The ball's in your court. Because you have to receive it. You have to develop a relationship with him. You have to come to a place in your life. You have to come to the cross. And it's like a crossroads that says, God, from this moment on, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to follow you. The Bible says it's a lot like Jesus dying on the cross and coming out of the grave. It's, it's, it's the same type of, um, it's an analogy. If you would, do you have that scripture, Leah? Last scripture and we're going to close. It's, you see, when you come to Jesus, you're willing to say, Lord, I laid down my life that I've been living, 
and I trade it in to you for a new life because I want to walk with you and serve you. And what that does is a couple things. The Holy Spirit of God, which the Bible says is the same spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, begins to live inside of you. And that spirit living inside of you makes the changes. But if you don't come to the place where you say, Jesus, I accept you, I want you into my life, you'll never have the Holy Spirit living within you to make those changes in your life. Only God can truly make change in your life. So it's like laying down your life. That, the, the one in Romans 6. So you, we come to the Lord, and it says this, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You guys can probably quote this scripture, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. You see, it's saying, God, you can have my life. We were buried, therefore, with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You can have a new life. You can have a fresh start. You can have a new beginning. All that sin that's been plaguing you, all those mistakes you've been making, all that trouble you've had, all that heartbreak, you can give it to God today. And say, God, I want a new beginning today. I want it right now, today. And God will give you a fresh start today. But the ball is in your court. He's done all he can do. He's done all he can do. He is the risen Lord. And we just have to accept what he's done for us. You have to take that step and meet him.